Hi, my name is Marty Case. Uh, I've flown the F-105 for a little over, or a little less than 2,000 hours. The airplane here is a uh, 1962 model. You can tell because the first two numbers on the serial number are 62. The airplane was designed in the middle to late 50s uh, using slide rules. No CAD cam on this airplane. Uh, so straight D has a smooth back. There was a humpback later on. Had a uh, super navigation system. Uh, and then there's the F model, which was the two-seater, first two-seater, and the G model, which was used in uh, Vietnam as a uh, SAM killer. Uh, it was a little heavier. Both the F and the G were a little heavier. I'll get to that later. This is normally where you would enter the airplane. Uh, that little handle up there, push on the top, pop it up, and there's a button on the side that would open the canopy. Get inside, put your parachute in, climb back down, look at the logbook. Uh, check out, talk with the crew chief about any items you might have. First thing you check, you come up here and uh, make sure the uh, guide vane, this is uh, a guide vane that uh, gives you the uh, stall angle of attack. It's hooked to the toss bomb computer and various flight control systems. It's an angle of attack indicator. Uh, Come down here and you'd look at these normally would be open. They've got them closed, disconnected and closed so that birds and stuff can't get in them. But this would normally be open. There's one thing in here you always check on the pre-flight. There's a little box had a safety switch for the armors when they were working on the gun. And on one or two airplanes that I know of, uh, that door wasn't closed properly or at all. And it was missed on the pre-flight and it jammed the nose gear up and the pilot ended up landing with the two mains down and the nose gear up. All the airplane did was land on its nose and grind to a halt. They put a new radome on it, new pedo boom, and it was good to go. Can't hurt this airplane. Uh, an interesting feature is this airplane was uh, actually way ahead of its time in, in as far as stealth goes. This is a corner box reflector for radar because under normal conditions, if it was raining or bad weather on GCA final, the GCA radar would lose the airplane because it was so hard to pick up on radar. The main reason for that is not only is it a very uh, smooth shaped airplane, the engine is what we call buried. The engine is not seen by radar. The radar doesn't look down the intake and see the engine. It's buried in the fuselage. Normally on most airplanes, with the engine exposed, the spinning blades are a great radar reflector. But this airplane wasn't, and the, on GCA, if they lost you, you could be in trouble because you needed to get on the ground. Fighters don't have a lot of uh, fuel to hang around. Uh, as I said, that's a corner reflector. You come out here, this is a hydraulic gauge. You'd normally check that for the uh, pre-charge. Uh, this is the gun bay, and normally this would be down. They cut these slots in here later on. Uh, the, the airplane was not like this originally. They had a couple of airplanes that the uh, when you're firing the gun, the gun, the unburned gases from the gun would build up in here. And there's a gun purge system that bleeds air from the engine, and it's supposed to blow those away. But if that gun purge fails or the circuit breaker pop, they would build up. And on two airplanes, it blew this door completely off. Didn't hurt the airplane, just blew the door off. Guy flew back and landed. Uh, coming around here, this is where the uh, Gatling gun, M61, 20 millimeter, 6,000 rounds a minute. The uh, gun drum holds 1,026 rounds. You can shoot, shoot all of them in 12 seconds if you held it down constantly. So you made very short bursts on the range. This was a camera for uh, seeing what you were shooting at. This is the radome. Behind here is the uh, radar antenna, which was used for the R-14 radar, primarily used for ground mapping. This airplane was designed back in the Cold War era where nuclear weapons were important. So this airplane was just fly, designed to fly very fast, very low, and would hold an internal uh, nuclear weapon. So the uh, radar antenna was here, and then the pitot boom, of course, standard on every airplane. On this side, uh, up here, 
this is the battery compartment. As far as I know, the 105 was the first airplane, uh, production airplane, to have a NICAD battery. It's a uh, 100 amp hour battery. It would uh, carry the entire load for almost an hour. And if you pulled one circuit breaker, you could extend that to two and a half hours. You'd lose some things that weren't real important, but you could make it last two and a half hours. And that was generally enough to get the airplane on the ground. Uh, this slot up here is the exhaust for the ATM air turbine motor. They used exhaust, or not exhaust gases, but compressor air from the engine again. Led the air, brought it up here. It powered the AC generator and the hydraulic system, the uh, utility hydraulic system. It was, uh, it, they had a sensor on there just in case you got an air leak because it was 13 stage bleed. It was very hot. It could cause a fire, so there's a warning light in the cockpit that tells you if that air has an air leak in it or if you get bullet holes or whatever, some other bad thing happened. Uh, the duck plugs. For supersonic flight, you, uh, you brought the flaps, leading edge flaps all the way up. Normally you had three positions, cruise them up, cruise them maneuver, and down. Uh, for supersonic flight, you wanted them up. The airfoil is, has, has no uh, curvature to it at all. It's a symmetrical airfoil, both the wings and the tail. All the airfoils on this airplane are symmetrical airfoils. The uh, duct plug was designed so that the engine would not have to eat supersonic air. Engines with all the spinning blades don't like supersonic air because you build up little shock waves. So what they did, they put a plug in here and above 1.5 Mach, this plug would start moving forward. It would generate a shock wave and move it forward away from the engine and the reason they do that is on the back side of a shock wave the air is always subsonic. So at 1.5 Mach, it would come into operation and start moving forward. Occasionally, uh, you could get that going 1.5 Mach on the deck, leaving the target area. One thing this airplane liked to do was go fast. Uh, this is the Bombay area. Now, I've got to tell you that one of the worst things a fighter pilot can say is that he flew an airplane that had a Bombay. But this had a Bombay, which is where primarily nuclear weapons. And also, when you had no nuke on board, you could have a uh, fuel tank carry 3,200 pounds of uh, fuel. Okay. Uh, these doors, normally, this little flipper door would be down. And these doors, and inside that flipper door, there were bleed vents. When the plugs were in operation, sometimes the air pressure would be too great and this would bleed the excess air off so that the shock wave didn't move out of the intake. And when the gear is down, this door was available to let extra air go to the engine for takeoff. And once the gear comes up, it mechanically closes those off. Over here, uh, normally, where this plate is, you would have P1 on the left side, P2, primary one, primary two, those are your two flight control systems. P1 was important because it had the stab aug system, uh, the stability augmentation system, which took the pilot's inputs and made the airplane very easy to fly, basically. Uh, the gear is held down, this is the mechanical downlock right here. The first thing that happens when you raise the gear handle is it pulls this out of the way and that allows the landing gear to come up. Once the gear is up and locked, it would catch a hold of this little flipper door and pull it up and, and shut it and the airplane would be nice and smooth on the bottom. This is the way the airplane was flown mostly. This is a 450 gallon fuel tank, carried 3,000 pounds of Jet 4. Same thing on the other side. If you didn't have tankers available, Beside the Bombay tank, there was also a 650 gallon tank that would fit on the belly of the airplane. One of the reasons the landing gear on this airplane is so large, so long, makes the airplane sit very high, is because also in combat you carried an MER, multiple ejector rack, that would carry six 750 pound bombs, or a couple of 3,000 pound bombs if you want to carry that much. But that made the load fairly close to the ground, so that's why the landing gear is so long on this airplane. The 
the other place we carried stores was out here on the outboard pylon. There was another pylon here. We could carry uh, two side winders or a single bomb. Same on the other wing. Uh, the maximum load on this airplane and in my squadron at uh, Tok Lee, we sent some guys over to Tonsonu and they carried 16 750 pound bombs. You could carry six on the center line, you carry four on the outboard, on the inboard on both sides, and one more on the outboard both sides. So that should be 16. That was a hell of a load of them. Of course, you didn't have very long time on station. <laughs> Radius of action was only a little over 100 miles, and you could only stay on station for five minutes with that configuration. We call these the dog ears. Uh, at one time, they changed the operating procedure on the airplane, which caused other problems. And one of them was, at certain air speeds, it would suck fuel back up into the, it would vent fuel out the vent, which we'll get to in a minute. And it would suck it back up between the, uh, outside the liner and the engine itself. And at certain speeds, under certain conditions, it would explode, which is a bad thing. So in order to fix that, they bled air from the engine again, and used it to force air through here and out the back end so that there was always a constant flow of air going through there instead of having the air stagnate. This is the original drain for hydraulics and fuel. The fuel tanks are in the fuselage. All of them are in the fuselage. It has wet, or excuse me, dry wings. There's no fuel in the wings. So if you had a leak back there, it would either come out of this, this hole here. That's a drain for the fuel tank, one of them. And this is another one for hydraulics and uh, fuel. Right behind that, is the tail hook or where it would be if this airplane doesn't have one but that's where it would be if we're engaging the barrier the old MA-1A barrier again symmetrical airfoil stabilator it's interconnected with the other half there's a big we called it the sewer pipe a great big pipe about that big around and at least uh, three quarters of an inch thick it went from this side to the other side and connected the two, there's one big piston under the bottom of the airplane that operates both of these stabilators. The speed brakes has four pedals, they're called. Two here and two here. Now, the engine was unique in that they had to keep the RPM up for the air turbine motor to have enough air to drive the utility and the AC generator. So the RPM was high enough that the airplane would taxi too fast. So their solution to that was on the ground with the throttle at idle, the engine would open the eyelids like it was in afterburner, only it wasn't, which meant that with, you know, when you open the nozzle, you reduce the pressure, so you reduce the thrust, which saved a lot of brakes when you're taxiing. The eyelids would pop open and the speed brakes would go to the ejector, what was called the ejector position. There's two actuators for each pedal, here and here. And on landing, with the gear down, top and bottom pedals were inoperative. Anytime the gear was down, top and bottom is inoperative. So that on landing, of course, you don't want this being open because you land with the speed brakes out. So you only have the two side panels. Plus, the drag chute, which is right up there, that little door right underneath the rudder, you probably can't see it is where the drag chute is. So for that reason, this one had to be closed, and this one had to be closed so you didn't drag it when you landed nose up. Engine is a uh, J75 Pratt & Whitney uh, Dash 19. Puts out 16,100 in military, uh, 24.5 in afterburner, and 26.5 with water injection. You have water injection for takeoff, and the tank was right over here on this side right up in there. That's where I took one of my hits, by the way. Um, holds 36 gallons and lasts for one minute. Used only on takeoff. You, you, couldn't, you weren't supposed to take it up in the air with you because if it froze, it could burst the tank or depending on your fuel condition, you could actually end up with a AFCG with 36 gallons of water that far back. 
but it was very handy on takeoff. Uh, well, there you can see the uh, drag chute door right under the trailing edge of the rudder. The blue light you see is a formation light. Helps keep the glare down. This was the uh, saber drain where the uh, excess fuel vent would vent out. This is longer than the original. The original was only about that long. And it brought it so close to the fuselage, like I said, on takeoff with a high angle of attack, it could be sucked back inside the engine. Well, that was one of the changes they made. That's an antenna, by the way. Uh, when we first got the airplanes, we would take them uh, non-stop from George Air Force Base. We'd refuel off the Farallon Islands and go non-stop to Hawaii. Of course, we had a 650, two 450s in the Bombay tank and all internal. So we had uh, 21,000 pounds of fuel. And this airplane likes to go fast, so your normal cruise is 400 indicated to 0.9. Oh, there was one feature I forgot to mention, the aileron lockout. The ailerons would be locked out above uh, 695 knots. That way you only had spoilers on the top for uh, aileron control, for roll control. The flaps uh, had a uh, limit of uh, 275. If you uh, exceeded that, they would blow up. Later on, they modified the airplane. They disconnect, there was an interconnect, a great big cable between the left and right flap, so that if one motor failed, the other would bring both, both flaps. But they found out that they were losing airplanes due to hydraulic systems getting shot up. So what they did was, they disconnected that cable and installed a system in the airplane where you would slow down to, to below 0.85 Mach and at approximately uh, 300 indicated, 300, 350, you throw a switch and that would bring some jaws down to that actuator for the stabilator. You would actually lock that stabilator in place. And then you had another switch, kind of like flying a model airplane. You could move each individual flap up and down or both of them together for pitch control. So you could actually fly the airplane using the flap motors. Uh, let's see. The nose wheel steering was good for uh, 40 degrees left and right. However, if you knew the airplane well enough, you could use the nose wheel steering, get it over to full deflection, let go of the button and step on that brake and you could actually pivot right on that gear so you could have a much shorter turn radius. Of course, it wasn't all that good for the tires, but that's somebody else's problem. Um, oh, and the rudder locked out at 275. The rudder went from 32 degrees each side to only 8 degrees each side. That was to keep from over controlling because it had a very effective rudder. You could do a very nice rudder roll in this airplane. The empty weight was right around 31,000 pounds. Uh, combat loads all up were right around 50 to 52,000 depending on what you were carrying, which is why it was nice to have water injection. Uh, one of the things I forgot to mention also was because of the heavy loads and taxiing and spinning the, the airplane around on one gear like that, it would actually twist the, the wing enough that the cracks were developing in the wing, so they ended up putting doublers on the top of the wing and on the bottom. Here's the bottom piece right here. The problem with that is the one on top cause the airplane to have a lot more drag between that and the dog ears and the slots they cut in the nose. Uh, the airplane uh, didn't like going, it wouldn't go supersonic unless you had a really hot airplane on the deck, I'm talking on the deck now. I've seen 730 on the deck leaving the target area. I don't know what it was in Mach, but that's what it was in Knott's calibrated airspeed. We had a CADC central air data computer that converted all the temperature and all that and gave you the indicator was actually the calibrated airspeed. One other thing I wanted to mention was the Sierra Hotel on the tail end of this airplane. The unit I was in at Tinker Air Force Base, we had a down day because of weather one day. 
and we were sitting around thinking about the the tail coat at that time was a UC yuck and we didn't like that uh, the air the uh, unit had been a 124 unit before we got there with a 105 so they didn't like us very much so they got UC for the tail coat so we decided we wanted to change it so while we were sitting around on a weather day we called TAC headquarters and talked to the guy who gave out unit identification codes. We said, we want to change ours. He said, that's great. What do you want? He said, I don't know. What do you, well, he thought about it for a minute and said, well, what about Sierra Hotel? He said, great. I've been waiting for somebody to ask for that. Uh, Sierra Hotel, uh, I'm not sure you want this on the film, but it stands for shit hot. So we figured we were shit hot fighter pilots, so we got Sierra Hotel on the airplane. Uh, Somebody at TAC headquarters after a couple of years got wind of it and they made us change it again. That's too bad. I really liked the cockpit layout on this airplane. It was very well thought out. Uh, the blind co cockpit check was, was pretty simple, really. For instance, one of the big things I always told my students about was the pitot heat switch. Uh, it was different from every other switch in the cockpit and there was no mistaking it because it had a little cube on the top like an ice cube. So all you had to do was feel around for that switch, turn it on and you knew you had just turned on the pitot heat. Uh, the gear and flaps, flap handle was on the throttle quadrant, as I said had three positions, up, off and down, and the leading edge, you can select that. Uh, afterburner, of course, is outboard on the throttle. Uh, there was an electrical panel. Oh, this was the emergency uh, button that you could punch and clean off the airplane. Over here, you had the uh, AC and DC generators, and uh, oh, the air conditioning was over here also. Normally, we turned that off for takeoff. Number one, it stopped leading the air and gave the engine a little bit more power. And number two, due to the humidity over there, if you left it on and it had a cold temperature selected, you could actually go IFR in the cockpit. It would just, you'd be a giant cloud inside the cockpit. At the front, of course, you had uh, the first airplane that had vertical tapes for instruments. Uh, left side was airspeed, right side was altitude. In between, you had a great big attitude indicator. Down below that, the HSI horizontal situation indicator. And we had, uh, markers that you could set for altitude and airspeed and you as you if you set them on a given airspeed and altitude whenever they came up off the bottom of the instrument it would lock on and you could line it up and it would line it up right across the horizon on the attitude indicator so you the guys that came to this airplane it was the first time they'd ever flown tapes everybody else had ground gauges and we had some for standbys but the primary instruments were tapes and they were worried about uh, converting to the tapes and I said guys trust me after 30 minutes in the cockpit you will not have a problem this is so e they are so easy to fly and of course they all found out that, that was true uh, there is one other thing I wanted to mention uh, if you ever listen to any tapes of combat or uh, stories or whatever you'll hear them use the phrase green them up and the reason for that is uh, as I said, this airplane was very well designed. Whenever you had all the switches set, nose tail, the nose or tail or safe, whichever you wanted to select, uh, the station selected for whatever you wanted to drop, all that, you had one more button to push. And when you pushed it in, it would say center or left outboard or left inboard, LI or LO, and they were green. So once you had all the switches set up, you push that in, and if it came up green, you knew that you were ready to drop. All you had to do was hit the pickle button on the top of the switch. Uh, top of the stick, I'm sorry. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention was, uh, as everybody knows, the airplane was designed to go fast. It has a, a coke, coke bottle fuselage because uh, Park Valley had, a, had trouble getting the airplane to go supersonic. And the area rule theory had uh, finally become widely known. So Carcavelli used that on this airplane. It, uh, normal climb speed was 400.9 Mach. That was just a normal, everyday. Initial was flown at 400 also normally, although the book said 350, but most of the times it was at 400. The airplane just felt better at that airspeed. 
The problem with an airplane that likes to go fast is when you have to go slow, uh, for instance landing. Uh, initially when the airplane came out, uh, 180 was the basic airspeed, but over time they added combat cameras and things on the tail, so they ended up posting. Each airplane was weighed and they would post an airspeed right under the airspeed indicator. And that could be anywhere from uh, 191 to 194. That was on the D. The F model was 2,000 pounds heavier. And the rule was for every 1,000 pounds of fuel, you added three knots. So the airplane was 2,000 pounds heavier than the F was. So it flew uh, six knots faster than the D. The G model was 2,000 pounds heavier than the F. So it had to go 12 knots faster than the straight D on landing. Now, keep in mind, if you had to carry divert fuel, uh, you had to add three knots for every thousand pounds of fuel. Long story short, you could end up flying a 210 or 215 or even a 220 final approach airspeed and touchdown. And if it was a rainy season and you were carrying divert fuel, which is one of the reasons you might be that heavy, you're landing on a wet runway normally. Now, landing on a wet runway above the speed for your drag chute, which is 200 indicated. Later on they came out with a uh, 230 knot drag chute because of this problem. But initially, when I was flying the airplane, 200 was your max airspeed, so you had to wait with those in the air, running down the runway, going by the distance markers at a rapid rate, until you got below 200. Then you pop the drag chute and you hope like heck it'll work. Hopefully you uh, got it stopped before the end of the runway.